Linda Gale or? Uh, yes, Linda Gale is my first name and Becca is my surname. OK. My guest today is Professor Linda Gale Becker, who is Professor of Medicine at the University of Cape Town and the Chief Executive Officer of the Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation. She is a past president of the International AIDS Society. Welcome, Linda Gale. Thank you very much, Joe. Yeah, so, I mean, you have done a lot of work in this area, so I want to use this uh, Lancet Commission's paper to sort of end our conversation, which is entitled Advancing Global Health and Strengthening the HIV Response in the Era of the Sustainable Development Goals in the International AIDS Society. Um, so uh, just to <laughs> just to give uh, you and the audience my bias, um, Linda Gale, so I grew up in South India uh, in a little bit of an island of healthcare, um, which was sort of far advanced I mean, the rest of the country. Uh, we have very few HIV cases. I just looked up the statistic, about 1,000 new cases, around 28 billion people. Um, and then I've been in the U.S. for nearly uh, 25 years now. Um, and um, before I read this, um, HIV was not in my psyche. I wasn't really thinking about it. I thought this, this is a problem we already solved. Um, but that's not the case. So you say here in uh, index X summary here, inspired by unprecedented improvements in human health and development in recent decades, our world has evolved on a quest that only a generation ago would have been considered unreachable, achieving sustainable health and development for all. Improving the health and well-being of the world's people is at the core of the sustainable development goals. SDGs, reflected in targets that call for ending the epidemics of AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, achieving enormous improvements in maternal and child health, and tackling the growing burden of non-communicable diseases, NCDs. Attaining universal health coverage is the means by which these ambitious health targets are to be achieved. So I always believed in this, um, Linda Gale. So in the US, we don't really have universal health coverage. Um, development, quote unquote, is sort of um, very difficult to define anymore. Um, we have high GDP per capita countries that some could argue are not necessarily developed <laughs> because there's a large population that's left behind. Stock markets always reach very highs. GDP, you know, we've got a lot of billionaires, and, you know, some trillionaires now in the US. Uh, but none of those metrics really matter, right? And in the grand scheme of things, none of those matter. So from Cape Town, from where you are and looking, looking outward from there, and I know that you have done a lot of work in other areas too, India and Bangladesh and other areas. So what is your perspective? Where are we heading? Are we, are we really making progress in global health? I think, as you suggest, the world is not a homogenous place. And so I think there are some places where and some areas where we see some progress. And then just as rapidly, we see other areas where we, we've either stalled or we are even, you know, one would say backsliding. Um, so, so this is not a universal problem solved um, and the challenges remain. And of course, global health sits within a broader social context where, as we know, you know, a, a war hits or a, a large um, climatic event happens and people are set back on their on their on their goals and on their progress. And so, you know, that um, it, it it remains a quest. I think that's the bottom line as mm. we can. And I think that's why these goals, such as the Sustainable Development Goals, become so important because it becomes a marker along which we can, you know, measure our progress and see how we're doing. And this has worked so brilliantly well in HIV where, you know, our, our agency devoted to AIDS, known as UNAIDS, um, 
which was first formulated in the early 2000, when I think there was recognition that there truly was a global emergency. Yeah. Um, we do see that goal setting helps even the most resource constrained areas um, find ways to solve or, or move towards progress, you know, and, and, and hold themselves accountable. And importantly, have civil society hold, you know, stakeholders uh, accountable. And so that's been my experience. Mm -hmm. I'm in Cape Town. Uh, it's at the tip of Africa, but it's in Southern Africa. And I live in a country that has the largest burden of HIV and TB. Luckily, we're somewhat spared malaria, um, but we have an enormous amount of HIV and TB. Maybe not on the same level in terms of TB as India, um, but certainly we have for our population size, we have a, you know, a very extraordinary uh, mm. prevalence of tuberculosis. And HIV, we really do have the biggest number of people living with HIV of any country in the world. Um, so we currently are treating about five and a half million individuals, uh, but we have still another one and a half, two million to find and start on antiretrovirals. Uh, and we haven't yet reached those goals, those magic goals that UNAIDS has set. They've set a goal of 95% of people being tested in the country for HIV, 95% of those people being on treatment on antiretroviral treatment, and 95% of those people being virally suppressed. And South Africa has not reached those goals. We were supposed to reach them uh, by 2025, but we are not on target to reach those goals. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it just tells me how ignorant I am. So when, when I think about South Africa, I think about sort of a developed country. Um, I went for a cricket. Uh, that that probably has some influence on that. Um, but you're saying uh, so both TB and HIV, it's still sort of epidemic proportions in the country of South Africa, Correct. which is an incredible thing. I mean, I can't even imagine. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I've, I've already mentioned to you that we have the largest number of people living with HIV on of any country in the world. And we're about 60 million individuals in, in this country. Tuberculosis, we are in the midst of a generalized TB epidemic. Now, yeah. as you well know, in your part of the world, in the north, um, in North, north America and in Europe, there was a decline in tuberculosis and the t generalized TB epidemic really came under control prior to antibiotics. So in the 1920s, TB was brought under control and that was largely structural because we didn't have um, antibiotics yet. Um, now we have in this part of the world been able to keep up with all of medical science. So, you know, we've notified TB, we've done, we brought in the antibiotics, we do TB dots, we we look for people with TB, we try and get them onto treatment, we have reasonable cure rates, yet we are still sitting in the midst of a generalized epidemic. So about 1% of the population is living with TB, uh, which are rates that, you know, really are unprecedented. And Cape Town is particularly hard hit by TB. And, you know, we don't fully understand that. Now, as you say, you're not even aware of this. You watch cricket on telly. If you were, <laughs> if you were a tourist and you flew into Cape Town and came to some of our beautiful uh, resorts, you would have no idea that we are sitting on the TB epidemic we are. Because again, TB tracks certain sectors of the community. So we have these large sprawling, you know, semi-formal to informal favelas, for want of a better word, we call them townships, which is exactly where tuberculosis lives and thrives, right? Um, so it's, 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 it's not a disease of poverty, but it thrives in that environment of crowding, of poor uh, air management. Um, and and yes, we, we have not been able to overcome the TB epidemic that was prevalent in the 1910, 1920s of Europe and North America. Yeah, I mean, it's really puzzling. So 
I mean, we had a vaccination for TB, I, I, I think, right? So, and then we have antibiotics, as you say, that can treat it. So why why are we having this difficulty? I mean, we 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 had this information for a long time. Yes, tragically, and you know, it's it, it. There's an extraordinary story about that. So if you look at how investment has been, if you think back over the last five years, the extraordinary investment in SARS-CoV-2 and in COVID-19, and the yeah. speed with which a vaccine and drugs were found to counter SARS-CoV-2. If you look at the HIV epidemic, which has been around now for four decades, um, we have thrown not quite as many zeros in terms of US dollars at, at HIV and AIDS, but we have proportionately probably given the second largest amount in terms yeah. of communicable diseases. And then TB and malaria lag way behind, you know, mm. sort of trying to bring up the rear. And so we have one vaccine for TB, which is administered to neonates at the time of birth. And we have a wonderful uptake, a very good uh, EPI system where neonatal delivery of BCG. And we have, you know, a handful of drugs that um, that we have relied on now for 120, well, a hundred years, let's say, mm. because they came into existence in in the fifties in nineteen fifty. Um, but the vaccine's been around forever. It's a hundred years old, mm. you know. <laughs> and it's only now that we're beginning to see new agents and new vaccines actually sort of move forward. Um, and so, you know, there just has been a lack of investment in innovation. Mm. And you know, I have to put that down to the fact that. SARS-CoV-2 was a global threat that threatened mm. even rich nations. <laughs> TB, yeah. HIV was a global threat that did threaten rich nations, but that has receded. And TB, unfortunately, is nowhere in that realm at all. So, so it does come down to R&D and how much money we throw at these problems. Um, yeah. And we've you know, in many ways, we've let the the low and middle income part of the world down in this regard. Yeah, so I, I can see that, uh, Linda, again. so I, I worked for a large pharmaceutical companies uh, in the 90s, um, and tropical diseases was more of a PR <laughs> thing. Um, so the few right. dollars go into it so that we can go out to the press. Uh, I'm going to take some plaque for this from the pharmaceutical industry uh, right. to talk about, you know, we have been investing into all these tropical diseases to save the world and all that. But pharmaceutical, pharma, there, there's no return in it. So at the end of the day, it's a shareholder value question. Um, and pharma companies never really focused on it. And so, so malaria, for instance, you know, my uh, my aunt actually worked in Kenya uh, uh, for a long time, and she came back home with with malaria, and she's living with it. Uh, this was a long time ago, like 40, 45 years ago. Um, and those diseases are actually quite bad diseases. I mean, if we can save a human from those diseases, it has a lot of societal value. But there's no shareholder value in it. And hence, pharmaceutical companies are not going to focus on it. So, so what's the solution for this? <laughs> well, you know, I think, and I think SARS-CoV-2 sort of also underpinned that for us, the antiretroviral uh, sort of, you know, initial um, launch of, of antiretrovirals way back in 2000, if you'll remember, 1996, these drugs cost, an exorbitant amount for us, and the, you know the 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 option was that people living in the north would live, and people in the south would die of AIDS. Mm. Um, similarly, when SARS-CoV-2 came along, the vaccines were in the north, and none of the vaccines <laughs> were in the south. So, yeah. you know, I think to a certain extent, it is about a global health problem, and we need to say there are certain things. And I, you know, I'm very pleased that now PEPFAR, this wonderful President's Emergency Fund for AIDS Relief 
that you know George Bush's administration first started, but the the democratic administration has continued and now you know it continues, although it's sitting in a precarious position <laughs> yeah. at the moment. We are um, all sitting now, in a very precarious situation right now. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm hoping that you know it will continue because now it's taken on both um you know HIV and AIDS, but also pandemic preparedness and this notion of of being ready for pandemics because it recognizes that infectious diseases don't pay attention to oceans or borders Mm. infectious diseases move where they need to move and in this day and age of connect connectivity i mean obviously there's social media connectivity but there's also airplane and ships and trains and boats um you know, we are all very, very at risk for pandemic starting, as we discovered. Wuhan became a worldwide problem. And so, you know, that I think needs to sit in our minds. And during times when there aren't pandemics, we need to be having these conversations about what do we, how do we define a a product that is considered a global good commodity? be it a vaccine or be it a life-saving drug, if it has that um, kind of characterization, then it should have a different uh, method for distribution. It should have a different financing uh, strategy. It should have a different tiered pricing, if you like. Um, And there should be recognition about commodities that are considered global good um, or, or for the global good. And that I would hope, you know, may be something that we can figure out as a as a global community when we are in times of peace, if you like, <laughs> or, you know, when there isn't a pandemic um, in our midst. Because as we saw in the midst of a pandemic, every country turned inwards. Um, India turned inwards. You know, North America mm. turned inwards. Uh, Canada could vaccinate all of their population four times when, you know, Africans had not yet had a single vaccine dose. That, you know, is something we need to really think about. And another solution is the solution that India has done is we need more self-reliance. So, you know, the continent of Africa needs to become more self-reliant in this regard, but that's going to take investment. That's going to take incredible resource investment to really get those systems up and going. But we're working on it. Um, and, you know, I think I think the last this last pandemic gave us all a huge jolt. Um, and there really is effort now to say, We should be able to make vaccines on the continent. We should be able to make at least some of the generic drugs on the continent um, and move, uh, you know, towards a more self-reliant picture. Hmm. Yes, self-reliance, it's my opinion, uh, Lidege, so is a double-edged sword in the sense that what I would rather see is 8 billion clones that we have on Earth sort of come together to solve a problem. Um, we have 200 countries, we have United Nations, doesn't seem very effective uh, from a perspective. So um, perhaps there is a way to think about, you know, the 200 nations and 8 billion people to solve problems of global scale. Um, and we haven't been able to do that, right? I mean, that is, that's what's lacking in my view. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right, Jill. And I think this is a little bit to bring us back to the commission. The commission was a little bit about saying we had a microcosm of that for HIV AIDS to a certain extent. You know, we really saw public, private, uh, civil society, uh, 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 UN. Actually, we did see the UN working quite effectively in this regard, the Global Fund for uh, tuberculosis, AIDS, and malaria. And of course, as I say, the wonderful President's Emergency Fund for AIDS Relief, which, you know, as as an African, I will always be grateful to the American people for that because it saved so many African lives. Um, You know, all of that coming together in the early Mm. 2000 was an extraordinary experiment of global solidarity to my mind. 
And we turned a disaster around. You know, 80 million people have been infected with HIV, of which 40 million have died. Um, but it would have been so much worse if we hadn't really come together and said, how do we get antiretrovirals to every corner of the world? How do we make sure that everybody has access to HIV testing and viral load, uh, it, it, you know, interventions? And so we, we, you know, sat down as a as an AIDS community in 2018 and said, some of those lessons need to be shared with the broader global community. We need to apply those lessons to the broader global health approach. And that's sort of what we're saying. What are the lessons we can learn from HIV into global health? And of course, what can global health bring into HIV? Because the epidemic is not over. And if we, our great fear is if we call it victory too soon and we walk away, we will lose the ultimate war because we will see HIV, you know, return. Um, and, and so it really is important to make sure the job is completely done before we disengage. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, that was the, the, the plea, given that we were looking around the world and seeing resources reducing, you know, attention spans beginning to, to really shrink. Uh, people, as you say, people thinking, well, this epidemic's over, we can move on to the next thing. And yeah. yet, it's far, you know, it's far from over. Uh, you know, in places like, and I, God knows even what it's like in Central Asia, in Eastern Europe today with the war going on, but we know that rates were actually on their way up before the Ukraine war. Um, and in North Africa and the and the you know those regions, we are still seeing infections actually go up and death rates go up. So it's it's not done by a long shot. And so how do we really harness all the passion we had in the last four decades to say let's keep it going and let's bring lessons to the broader community? Yeah, so eradication has to be the goal. And you cannot get eradication with, you know, millions of infections going on. Um, AIDS is, uh, I mean, I don't know much about the slender gale, but AIDS is one of those unique diseases where education also plays a big role, right? So um, the larger, I know, I know George W. Bush was actually pretty behind, um, you know, sort of trying to eradicate the idea. I don't know what Obama did or the subsequent um, administrations did, uh, but the fact that we still have millions of infections of this disease is tells me that we are either not focusing on it or something happened, something is going on that I can't quite understand. You know, I think, Jill, what, one of the important tenets of infectious diseases is, you know, like any infectious disease, you've got to find the people who are living with the infection, treat them and make sure they're safe. Uh, and usually that renders them non-infectious, which is the same for HIV. We know that if we get them onto antiretrovirals and they become undetectable, then they are uninfectious. So that we call secondary prevention and it saves lives. So it's really important. But we've also got to do primary prevention, which means protecting those people who are susceptible from that infection. And we haven't done the latter well at all. If you remember, you know, we sort of came out in the first couple of decades with this notion of stop having sex. Well, that obviously wasn't wasn't going to be very popular, you know. And then we said, well, then if you can't stop having sex, then at least stick to one partner. Again, you know, if people are young and growing and learning and discovering their sexual beings, that's also not going to be popular. And then we said, well, otherwise, you know, you have to condomize and Again, that's tricky for people um, and it's worked to an extent, but it hasn't been sufficient. And, you know, it is only really in the last decade that we have seen other primary prevention modalities come forward. And of course, we need a vaccine. We just mm -hmm. haven't been able to find that holy grail of, a, you know, an effective, safe, cheap, preventive vaccine. And that is 
you know, it's how we got rid of smallpox. It's how we're getting rid of yeah. polio. It's why we hardly see diphtheria around anymore. It is what we need, and it still needs huge investment in the laboratory to find that vaccine that is going to make a difference. In the meantime, what we know is we can use antiretrovirals as prophylaxis, which is, of course, what we do in malaria. Yeah. And we can use antiretrovirals taken by an individual who's not living with HIV to prevent them getting HIV. And that's been slow to take off, but we're beginning to see it now roll out. And I think if we bring treatment as prevention and primary prevention together in a really effective way, whilst doing the education, as you say, you know, knowledge is power. It's really yeah. important that people know what they're dealing with. If we can bring all those pieces together, um, and reduce stigma, because the other thing that plagues HIV from the get-go is just the level of stigmatization that people feel associated with the disease or, you know, at risk of the disease, then I think we have a chance to eliminate, maybe not eradicate, but at least eliminate, um, you know, the virus from many more parts of the world. Yeah, well, what, what is disheartening about this is that, um... They are very good uh, when there's an external threat, a virus, a bacteria, so HIV, TB, uh, malaria. Uh, when there's an external th threat to the human body, um, if if you put our mind to it, and as you say, R and D dollars to it, uh, we can solve it. I mean, this is these these are problems we have solved many many times before. Where we fail this autoimmune diseases, you know, cancer, uh, stuff like that, that we have no clue yet <laughs> how to solve. So these are external agents that are creating diseases um, that if, if, if the pharmaceutical industry wants, wants to solve it, they can definitely solve it. And then NIH, um, I don't know, the World Health Organization, um, if they put as you said, sufficient dollars to solving the problem. These 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 are not technically, I would say, well, technically complicated problems in the sense that we we just need to put sufficient dollars to it. So what's puzzling is that we let this linger. Malaria is an interesting thing, uh, actually. Um, it still lingers. We haven't eradicated that. Uh, TB is actually showing up in North America and Canada, actually. <laughs> so maybe you'll get some dollars to it at some point. Um, so these are problems that maybe the Western countries don't see, and hence they don't really have an appreciation for the human suffering that goes with it. Do you see it that way? Yep. Without doubt. I mean, that is exactly it. So, you know, when we make the mistake that when these wonderful tourists come to our country and we grateful they come, it's, you know, a huge part of our income, GDP, but they never see the underbelly. They never see the problem that, um, you know, that truly perhaps would make them think Again, um, maybe they wouldn't come <laughs> if they knew that there was an airborne uh, disease that's very prevalent here. But the, but the bottom line is that, um, you know, take for example, again, I, I can't help but put the example when SARS-CoV-2 hit, yeah. think of the number of pharmaceutical companies that stepped forward to say mm -hmm. they would make vaccine. We do not have a single pharmaceutical <laughs> industry that is in any way involved in HIV vaccinology. J&J &J was there a little while ago. They've just stepped out. Um, mm. You know, there is not a single pharmaceutical. And so it has to happen in academia. And of course, the wheels of academia turn incredibly slowly in comparison. <laughs> yes. It's not to say it's not to say that, you know, there's any lack of brilliance. It's just you don't have whole factories of people with a single minded focus of solving a problem, as you say. Um, and, you know, that's the same with, with malaria. We have we see GSK recently, but again, very few um, sort of stepping forward and really making a difference. So until we again can think of a, a method 
to de-risk. You spoke of the shareholders, they have to be kept happy. You know, how do you de-risk the fact that they are going to make a product that is going to have to be sold at a very low, cheap rate in third world countries? And that is a conundrum for the global world to solve. You know, it's it. I think we need to find solutions for that kind mm. of problem. Yeah, I, I have, I have to say, very low faith in Linda Gale on, you know, sort of profit seeking pharmaceutical companies solving this problem. I, I know that uh, the Gates Foundation, for instance, looked into, uh, I don't know the details of this. You know, so, I mean, malaria is spread by mosquitoes. So, if we can sort of re engineer the mosquitoes that cannot carry the malaria virus, perhaps we can reduce it. Um, I think ultimately it has to be foundations and people who are interested in humanity <laughs> to come to come together to solve the problem. It's not going to be profit-seeking pharmaceutical companies. I I have no faith in that. I I have a I'm very pleased to be the the chairperson of a the board of an organization called Access to Medicines, um, hmm. and they do wonderful work. They're an NGO in the Netherlands. And they do brilliant work. And the the modus operandi there is to rank the major pharmaceutical industries in terms of their plans for access to medicines. So it's a range of medicines, some of them antibiotics, some of them, you know, medicines for non-communicable diseases. There's insulin on the list, et cetera. So pharmaceuticals at large, how are they doing? in getting global access to their best products and you know they get ranked and so there's a so and gates has been involved in kind of making sure that people come to the table and so on so there's an element of competitiveness you know mm. who's in the top five who's in the top three but they also bring investors into the picture so the investors get to see the ranking um and they also you know get to weigh in on how is pharmaceutical x doing in solving you know this problem of access and mm. and i think it's it's so it's a carrot approach as opposed to yeah. a stick <laughs> approach um but i i think you know i think it is another way of going about it and you know maybe i'm not quite as cynical as you, yourself maybe we can still <laughs> appeal to you know to the better nature of of pharmaceutical industries I, I hope so. So there's another angle here. This is not in your research in the year, but I just want to get a perspective on this. So we thought the world population uh, was going to peak in 2100. But with all the stuff that, is, that has been going on with the uh, decline in um, fertility rates all around, the, all around the world, only some parts of Africa and India is actually growing. So now the expectation is that we will peak at 2060. And we peak at 2060 at about 9 billion and then decline rapidly, decline very, very rapidly after that. So we could come to a position that human resources are the most valuable thing on Earth, uh, which is a sort of a very different context that most people have grown up in. You know, they, they're wondering, you know, there's so many people, they don't have any food, any water. <laughs> Uh, we are in sort of the opposite side of that equation um, now, and I wonder what that will do <laughs> to, to medical say, research and and all of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I I must say, I, 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 it must be awesome to live in a part of the world where that threat hangs over you, because we're here in Africa. It feels really we're moving into a youth bulge, um, and in fact, our scenario is just we have this incredible you know, middle part of the pyramid, which is just bulging. So, you know, I think, I forget the figure, but something like one in four of young people will live on this continent in in 2030 or, or whatever. whatever. The African it's a, continent. It's a, yes, it's, it's yeah. an extraordinary, extraordinary, um, you know, number of young people coming. And yeah. so our big, immediate problem is how do you keep these people employed and you know are we educating them in a way that really is going to be useful and then in this 
rather lager mentality, frankly, quite xenophobic world. Mm. Can we, you know, do you export that? But of course, the best of the best are the ones who leave. Um, and those people who, you know, millions of them get exported to North America every year, you know, and and we, yeah, so I, I think in the acute sort of immediate uh, few years, we, we have another set of problems um, that that uh, that is on our doorstep. But I certainly am reading how Japan is anxious that they, you know, they lack human resource mm. expertise and so on. So, again, it's important for us to recognize the world is, is not one place, but each each region, if you like, needs its own kind of set of solutions and its own approach. Um, um, and, you know, again, is there a way that we can be more global in our problem solving? So is, is there a way that, you know, the, the hunger in Africa can, you know, can be in some ways helped by being having a more global outlook? So, so you know, I th those are those are questions that are above my pay grade, but but certainly <laughs> from where I sit, um, you know, it's. The, I think you're right. We have this sort of acute set of problems. We yeah. have the medium term problems, then we have the long term problems. Often, our governments are only dealing with the acute problems. That's all there. The sort of five year plan is is what is right on their doorstep and. And that's where I, um, you know, also find myself uh, really caught up in that of of the immediate needs of people who every day are going down with HIV, facing a lifetime of living with the virus this week, dying of tuberculosis, um, you know, young people becoming so obese that they're developing diabetes before the, you know, the age of 20. Uh, unintended pregnancy rates that are through the roof. So those are the day-to-day -day problems, let alone the mental health difficulties that we're seeing in, in the context of today's turmoil. So, you know, it's um, it's that's, that's my bread and butter from a daily basis. Yeah, we're going to beat you on that, Linda Gale. So we have uh, about half the population has, uh, have hypertension. And as you know, we are a very obese country. <laughs> I'm talking about the U.S. Yes. Um, and, and so I, I don't know, you know, if th that's a localized phenomenon. We, we had a CEO on the program, Linda Gale. She's also uh, from Cape Town. And her company is basically looking at how to create sort of artificial intelligence, machine learning experts in Africa, all around Africa. And so my belief is that Africa should not be dealing from a position of um, weakness, but rather a position of strength, which is, as you say, young people, and all they lack is information. You give them information and they can go places, right? Totally. Couldn't agree more. I call it cashing in on evolving capabilities and you know, I see it every day, the innovation, the resilience, the ability, to, I call it hustling for health, you know, and um, they're hustling for health all the time. And, you know, it's extraordinary um, it, just what young people with very few resources can actually pull out of the hat. Um, so you're right. I think if if my country and I'm, you know, one country in the 97 or however many in on the continent, if my country can really get itself organized, what it'll do is recognize the wealth we have in young people um, and ensure that, you know, one, we educate them properly. That's where the investment needs to go. And two, we give them employment opportunities. You know, that's the other very, very important thing to do. So that's, you know. That's the answer here. I absolutely, and I believe we can be a resource for the world, as as you've already alluded. So that's where my optimism takes me. Yeah, so going back to the disease uh, arena, so is WHO doing a good job? I mean, well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> let, me, let me rephrase it. Um, 
Yes, as you say, you know, when you see a uh, pandemic, we sort of jump in and try to solve that problem. Um, but HIV, TB, malaria are not pandemic levels. What of the definition of a pandemic is, but they're epidemic levels. Uh, in many cases, they're localized. Um, and so, does WHO um, really uh, understand it or, or help there? Uh, where are they? Yeah. I think maybe it comes down to the model. Uh, you know, I think I see it as some extraordinary well-meaning individuals who, who you know, do come together, do ha are able to offer, you know, technical know-how, technical support, but n not huge resources. Um, they're not the CDC, right? They're not the people who go out and handle the pandemic or shut it down or they... They have no power. They, Basically, they, yeah. that's right. They act through governments and through the member states. Um, and really, it's an advisory, you know, here's our best guidance, please do it right kind of approach. And, you know, that again, you know, sometimes it's a mixture of the stick and the carrot. Um, it works to a degree, it works in some areas better than others. Um, yeah, I, I would say that you've probably diagnosed it the best as just you, you've you given an organization a huge job, but you haven't really given them much power. Mm. So do we do we need sort of a global CDC? I mean, we know that we are going to deal with a lot of these types of problems um, at the pandemic level and the ep epidemic levels. Uh, so do we need something different uh, from a policy yeah, perspective? Again, I mean, I think it's been extraordinary to see post pandemic how many academic institutions have mushroomed, you know, pandemic preparedness organizations mm. or institutes or whatever. And so again, we're very siloed. Um, mm -hmm. So I think you raise you raise a great point. Could we have come together and had, you know, this one organization? You know, maybe it will still happen. I would imagine that that makes the most sense. Uh, whether it's feasible and possible in this crazy divided world, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> but but it does seem to me that, you know, kind of there is a part of you that constantly wonders, you know, who's actually in control if anyone is driving the bus. <laughs> because because there's, there's, as you know, there's scale in research, there's scale in intervention, and so if 200 countries sort of go off and try to do things, we are going to be much less effective. And so, you know, I mean, we were worried about, I mean, we are still worried about it, <laughs> nuclear, nuclear war. Uh, that hasn't gone away. Um, that's how the United Nations happened. But we might be wiped out even before that, <laughs> you know, through some uh, biological uh, system. And so maybe some sort of United Nations with with teeth <laughs> in the biological arena might be useful. It's an interesting thought whether it's feasible. We <laughs> we have we have had an African CDC, and in fact, the new PEPFAR ambassador John Nkengesong, uh, Ambassador Nkengesong, was leading Africa CDC. That's that's the job that he left behind to take up his current position. Um, it's new. It was sort of getting off the ground. I, th I think it'll be interesting to see how that um, how that pans out over time. But again, you know, who provides the resources for these kinds of multi level organisations? Um, and I think that again is what sort of holds the Africa CDC back is just the ability to really make a difference um, comes down to resources. Yeah. Excellent. So do, do you have any uh, closing thoughts, Linda Gale? I mean, uh, so from a policy perspective, so if, if you were the king of the world, what well, the queen of the world, I should say, uh, what are the sort of the one, two, three things that you would want to put in place to make humanity better? I do think this question of global access is an important one, and it's one we need to do in the time of peace and non-pandemic, uh, you know, 
crisis. So how who do we put in the room to talk about what how do we define a global commodity and mm. what is the the policy structure around that. So that that would be one that I would really because that the pain of being rationed and watching people die when there are life saving interventions elsewhere is is something I've now done through two pandemics and I'd prefer not to face a third one if at all possible. Um, you know, then, then secondly, I think there is opportunity for us to learn north to south, south to south. How, how do we learn from each other? But also, how do we take lessons from one disease area into another disease area? And, you know, let's not reinvent the wheel every time. And what are and, you know, how do we do that kind of group learning, if you like? And then my third would be that at our peril, we leave communities out. You know, yeah. we leave the community of tuberculosis out. We left the community of COVID out. And by community, I mean civil society, broad, the people who get the infection. And we need to draw those people more into our problem solving mm -hmm. and our approaches. Um, and I think we did it pretty well in HIV. I think we continue to worry about it. Um, and I think that global health would be better at large if we applied that very important concept going forward. Yeah, there's also a little bit of an education issue here, right? So, I mean, I'm not far from an expert, but I, I had no clue where HIV was. I thought that problem was solved. And then TB and malaria, as we, as we mentioned, uh, I knew TB and malaria existed because of my Indian um, background. Um, so there is sort of an education issue. There might be a large number of people who might be believing that these are not particularly important issues, right? So is there some sort of a global education aspect? That's yeah, I think so. I, I definitely think so. You know, I mean, 1.3 million people became infected with HIV. That's a, in my country, a thousand young women every week become infected. Those are young women between the ages of 15 and 24 become infected with HIV, face a lifetime of taking antiretrovirals if they are found. And if they get pregnant before they are found and started on antiretrovirals, there's a risk that they transmit to their unborn children. And to that end, 130,000 young babies were born with HIV in this last year, one year. And that, you know, that's a travesty. We have the tools, we have the wherewithal, we can stop this. We have not done so. And the fact that we have not done so is on us. Every single one of us on this planet, the 8 billion people who walk and live on this planet. So the so, so I know you have to go. So from a healthcare policy perspective, is it UNESCO? So I'm thinking education now. I'm thinking, you know, sort of getting the 8 billion people sort of aware of the problems that we are facing. And I would argue most of them are not aware of it. And that goes into elections, that goes into policy makers. So is there a United Nations organization that is sort of supposed to do this in some ways? Yeah, we have a thing mm. called UNAIDS, uh, UNAIDS um, that is a part of the UN. Um, it exists in New York and in Geneva. Um, we have uh, the International AIDS Society as a large member organization. Um, we have the Global Fund for malaria, HIV, and TB. Um, you know, we have PEPFAR, all of these organizations, and we have the WHO. <laughs> so we have all of these organizations that should be coming together to make sure that messages, unfortunately, which is, as you know, we get into our echo chamber and the people who know about HIV talk to the people who know about HIV and the people mm. who know about heart disease sit in a room and talk to people who know about heart disease. And so how do we break those silos down? And that's exactly to come back, Jill, to where we started, was this yeah. notion of putting HIV within a broader global health agenda and saying, let's hold hands with the broader community. Let's share our lessons 
and let's bring more answers to more areas uh, through shared learning, basically. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks so much for spending time with me, Linda Gale. Real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for Thank your you. time. Take care. Bye. Bye.